Chapter Eight of Saverine's Disappearance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Red Abrus. The Gerard Street Mystery and Other Weird Tales by John Charles Dent. Saverine's Disappearance, Chapter Eight. A guest arrives at the Royal Oak. It was getting on towards the middle of the month of August, 1859. The harvest all along the Millbrook and Spotswood Road was in full progress, and a bounteous harvest it was, even for that favoured region. Squire Harrington confidently counted upon a yield of fifty bushels of wheat to the acre, True, he was a model farmer and knew how to make the most of a good season, but his neighbors were not far behind him, and were looking forward to full granaries when threshing should be over. For once there was little or no grumbling at the dispensations of Providence. The weather had been as propitious as though the local tillers of the soil had themselves had a voice in the making of it, and even gruff Mark Stolliver was constrained to admit that there were fewer grounds for remonstrating with the great disposer of events than usual at this season of the year. Every wheat field in the township presented an active spectacle throughout the day. The cradles were busily piled from early morn till nightfall, and the swaths of golden grain furnished heavy work for the rakers and binders. The commercial crisis of 1857 had made itself felt in the district, as well as in all other parts of Upper Canada. Many of the farmers had fallen considerably behind hand, and had, for once in a way, felt the grip of hard times. But the prolific crops which were now being gathered in bade fair to extricate them from such obligations as they had been compelled to incur, and the prevailing tone was one of subdued though heartfelt satisfaction. On the evening of Saturday, the 13th of the month, sundry of the yeomen who lived thereabouts assembled at Lapierre's after a hard week's work to congratulate one another on the prospects of the harvest and to discuss a few tankards of the remaining ale for which the royal oak was famous throughout the township. The landlord himself was on hand, as usual, to dispense the hospitalities of his bar and larder. The five years which had rolled over his head since that memorable night of Saverine's disappearance had left but slight traces of their passage upon his jovial countenance. He had never been able to fathom the impenetrable secret of that strange July night, but he had all along been wont to remark that the mystery would be cleared up some day, and that he confidently expected to hear some tidings of the missing man before he died. As for his guests, though most of them had resided in the neighborhood at the time of his disappearance, they had long ceased to give themselves any particular concern about the matter. So long as there had seemed to be any prospect of getting at the bottom of the affair, they had taken a vigorous part in the search, and had exerted themselves to bring the mystery to light. But when month succeeded month, without supplying any clue to the puzzle, they had gradually resigned themselves to the situation, and, except when the topic came up for discussion at their Saturday night meetings, they seldom indulged in anything more than a passing allusion to it. Ten o'clock had struck, and it seemed improbable that any further company would arrive. The assembled guests, to the number of seven or eight, sat in their accustomed places around a goodly-sized table in the room behind the bar. Lapierre occupied an easy chair, placed near the door communicating with the bar, so as to be handy in case of his being needed there. Farmer Donaldson had just regaled the circle with his favourite ditty, the roast beef of old England, which he flattered himself he could render with fine effect. Having concluded his performance, he sat modestly back in his elbow chair and bowed to the vociferous plaudits accorded to him. The tankards were then charged afresh, and each man devoted himself to the allaying of his thirst for the next minute or two. 
mine host had promised to give faintly as tolls the evening chime in the course of the evening and was now called upon to redeem his pledge ah he remarked that was always a favorite song of mine and don't you remember how fond of it our friend Safrin used to be he used to call for it regular every saturday night just before supper in the old times ah but that was a strange business i have never been able to think of it without perspiring and so saying he dived into the pocket of his white linen jacket and produced therefrom a red silk handkerchief with which he mopped his beaming countenance until it shone again eh responded farmer donaldson that was the strangest thing as ever happened in these parts i wonder if it will ever be cleared up you know my opinion about that resumed the host i always said he would turn up and it is let me see yes it is more that five years ago it was on the night of the seventeenth of july eighteen fifty four and here it is the middle of august eighteen fifty nine well well how the years go by safarin was a good sort i thought much of him and would like to see him once again i don't say but what he was a good fellow remarked one of the company but i can tell you he had a devil of a temper of his own when his blood was up i remember one night in this very room when he had some words with sam dolson about the black mare of his him he fired up like a tiger and that scar on his cheek glowed like a carbuncle it seemed as if it was going to crack open i made sure he was going to drop into sam and he would have done too if our landlord hadn't interfered and calmed him down yes yes interrupted farmer donaldson saverin had his tempers no doubt when he had been drinking more free than common but he was a jolly feller all the same i wish he was with us at this moment this sentiment was pretty generally re-echoed all round the festive board just then a rather heavy footstep was heard to enter the adjoining bar-room from outside the landlord rose and passed out through the doorway to see if his services were required the door of the communication was left open behind him so that the company in the inner room had no difficulty in seeing and hearing everything that took place in the middle of the bar room stood a short heavy-set man whose dress and bearing pronounced him to be a stranger in those parts he was apparently middle-aged say somewhere between thirty-five and forty his clothing was of expensive material but cut after a style more pronounced than was seen in canada or has ever since been much in vogue here his hat was a broad-brimmed panama which cost twenty dollars if it cost a penny his coat so far as could be seen under his thin summer duster was of fine bluish cloth short of waist long of skirt and the duster notwithstanding plentifully besprinkled and travel stained with dust the waistcoat which seemed to be of the same material as the coat was very open-breasted and displayed a considerable array of shirt front across the left side was hung a heavy gold watch chain from which depended two great bulbous looking seals on his feet he wore a pair of gaiters of patent leather white from the dust of the road in one hand he carried a light jaunty malacca cane while the other grasped a russian leather portmanteau called by him and by persons of his kind a valise he wore no gloves a fact which enabled you to see on the middle finger of his left hand a huge cluster diamond ring worth any price from a thousand dollars upwards his face was closely shaven except for a prominent moustache he had a crisp curling black hair worn tolerably short his eyes were rather dull and vacant not because he was either slow or stupid but because he felt or affected to feel a sublime indifference to all things sublunary 
you would have taken him for a man who had run the gauntlet of all human experiences a man to whom nothing presented itself in the light of a novelty and who disdained to appear much interested in anything you might say or do taken altogether he had that foreign or rather cosmopolitan look characteristic of the citizen of the united states who has led an unsettled wandering life his aspect was fully borne out by his accent when he began to speak yeah, are you the landlord he asked as the host stepped forward to greet him he received a reply in the affirmative this then is the royal oak tavern and your name is lapierre two nods signified the host's further assent to these undeniable propositions have you got a spare bedroom and can you put me from now till monday morning the landlord again signified his assent whereupon the stranger put down his cane and portmanteau on a bench and proceeded to divest himself of his wrapper you have had supper asked lapierre well i had a light tea down to millbrook but i know your saturday night customs at the royal oak and if you han't got any objections i'd like to take a hand in your eleven o'clock supper to tell the truth i am sharp set and i know you always have a bite of something appetizing about that time upon being informed that supper would be ready at the usual hour and that he would be welcome to a seat at the board he signified a desire to be shown to his room so that he could wash and make himself presentable in response to an inquiry about his horse he intimated that the animal for the present consisted of shank's mare that he had ridden up from town with squire harrington and dismounted at that gentleman's gate the squire offered me to drive me on as far as here he added but as it was only a short walk i reckoned i would come on afoot without further parley the guest was shown to his chamber whence he emerged a few minutes later and presented himself before the company assembled in the room behind the bar hope i ain't intruding gentlemen he remarked as he took a vacant seat at the lower end of the table i have often heard of the good times you have here on saturday nights heard of them when i was a good many hundred miles from here and when i didn't expect ever to have the pleasure of joining your mess yes i'd better introduce myself my name's thomas jefferson haskins i live at nashville tennessee where i keep a hotel and do a little in horse flesh now and again now i shall take it as a favor if you will allow the landlord to refill your glasses at my expense and then drink good luck to my expedition all this with much volubility and without a trace of bashfulness the company all round the table signified their hearty acquiescence and while the landlord was replenishing the tankards the stranger proceeded to further enlighten them respecting his personal affairs he informed them that a man had cleared out from nashville about six months ago leaving him the speaker in the lurch to the tune of twenty seven hundred dollars a few days since he had learned that the fugitive had taken up his quarters at spotswood in upper canada and he had accordingly set out for that place with intent to obtain a settlement he had reached millbrook by the seven o'clock express this evening only to find that he was still fifteen miles from his destination upon inquiry he learned that the stage from millbrook for spotswood ran only once a day leaving millbrook at seven o'clock in the morning there would not be another stage until monday morning he was on the point of hiring a special conveyance and of driving through that night when all of a sudden he had remembered that lapierre's tavern was on the millbrook and spotswood road and only three miles away he had long ago heard such accounts of the royal oak and its landlord and particularly of the saturday night suppers that he had resolved to repair thither and remain over for monday's stage i was going to hire a livery to bring me out here he added but a gentleman named squire harrington who heard me give the order for the buggy told me he lived close by the royal oak and that i was welcome to ride out with him as he was just going to start for home that saved me a couple of dollars and so here i be 
Lapier could not feel otherwise than highly flattered by the way the stranger referred to his establishment, but he was wholly at a loss to understand how the fame of the Royal Oak, and more especially of the Saturday night suppers, had extended to so great a distance as Nashville. In response to his inquiries on these points, however, Mr. Thomas Jefferson Haskins gave a clear and lucid explanation, which will be found in the next chapter. End of chapter 8 Recording by Red Abrus, July 2008